Welcome. Shall we turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4? And I'd like to read uh, verse 12 as I begin. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. I heard a wonderful story recently about Franklin Roosevelt, the American president. As part of his presidential duties, he often had to endure long receiving lines at the White House. And he used to complain that no one ever paid any attention to what he said. So one day during a reception, he decided to try an experiment. To each person who passed down the line and shook his hand, he murmured, I murdered my grandmother this morning. Nobody seemed to hear a word he said. And they continued to respond with phrases like, Marvellous, keep up the good work. We're so proud of you. God bless you, sir. And it wasn't until the end of the line that somebody actually heard what he'd said. I think it was the ambassador from Bolivia, who looked slightly embarrassed, leant over and whispered, I'm sure she had it coming. Now we live in a word of world of words today, don't we? Words have never been so plentiful. But who actually listens to them? One of the most striking things about our culture today is the extraordinary amount of communication. Mobile phones, texts, email, MSN, Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, all supposedly there to help us communicate. And yet at the same time, so many people feel totally isolated, as though nobody listens to them. Last year in the UK alone, the Samaritan received something like 2.5 million calls. Deirdre, the agony aunt of the sun, gets 200 letters and 800 emails every week. Because people feel they have no one else they can talk to. Even the most famous of people find the same. Not long ago, the papers were full of stories about Michael Jackson, probably the most famous face in the entire world. Wherever you go, people know and recognize him. But at the same time, all they seemed able to talk about in the light of his death was how desperately lonely he was. He had all the fame, all the money, all the success that anyone could ever imagine, and more. And yet, from the earliest stage in his life, he'd always felt desperately lonely. But of course, it's nothing new. Loneliness, a sense of isolation, has been with us from the very beginning. And here in chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes, the king speaks of loneliness and isolation. But at the same time, he also hints at a solution. He first of all speaks of the loneliness of oppression in verses 1 to 3. I saw the tears of the oppressed. They have no comforter. Power is on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. I think uh, Derek Kidner, the great commentator, said that these are the saddest words in the entire book. And here the king speaks of the loneliness of oppression, the loneliness of being split up from those we love of being unable to say what we really think, of not knowing who our real friends are, of being frightened of every knock at the door and ring of the phone, to such an extent that it almost would be better never to have been born at all. I recall nearly 20 years ago village, uh, visiting Romania just after the revolution. We went to a couple of little villages in Transylvania where there was great poverty. And I remember sitting with the head teacher of the local village school talking about the events of the previous year. She spoke of the confusion that they all felt, how the police were exactly the same as they had been before, except that instead of beating people up, they would smile and greet them as though nothing had ever happened. Well, when we spoke, she actually spoke in a whisper, because even then she had no idea who might be a former, a mole, a government stooge. Now imagine what it must be like not to know whom you can trust, whom you can speak to, where the only person you can trust is yourself. Well, that's the, the loneliness of oppression that the king speaks of. He then speaks of the loneliness of envy in verses 4 to 6. I saw all that labour and all achievement spring from man's envy of his neighbour. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. So much of modern day advertising, so many of our aspirations are about envy, aren't they? about wanting something that we don't have and being envious of others who have it. Even our neighbours, our friends, we're jealous of them. We're envious of what they have and we don't. And what it does is cut us off from them. It isolates us from them. 
And it is all so pointless, as the writer says. Verse 6, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. What's the point of getting all these things? Are they really going to make us happy? Why be split off from those that we know and love just because they've got something we haven't? I remember hearing the story not long ago of a rich businessman who was on holiday and he was watching a fisherman by the side of a lake and he was rather disturbed to find this man just sitting there doing nothing. Why aren't you out there fishing, he said. Well, because I've caught enough fish for today, said the fisherman. Well, why don't you catch more fish than you need, the rich man asked. Well, what would I do with them? Well, you could earn more money, said the, came the reply. You could buy a better boat so you could go deeper and catch more fish. You could purchase nylon nets. You could catch even more fish. You could make more money. Soon you'd have a fleet of boats and you'd be rich like me. And the fisherman asked, well, what would I do then? Well, he could sit down and enjoy life, he said. Well, the fisherman said as he looked out to sea, that's just what I'm doing now. See, it's the loneliness of envy. If we spend our lives just envying other people, it always gives us this sense of isolation. Then there's the loneliness of being past it. Verses 13 to 16. Better a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who no longer knows how to take warning. The youth may have come from prison to the kingship or he may have been born in poverty within his kingdom. I saw that all who lived and walked under the sun followed the youth, the king's successor. There was no end to all the people who were before them. But those who came later were not pleased with the successor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Slightly complicated, but the meaning surely is this. It is very lonely being the leader, being the king, particularly if you've been in power for a long time, because people prefer youth. Youth tends to be more willing to listen and learn, whereas the older person has maybe become hardened and bitter and no longer listens. Instead, he looks over his shoulder and sees the younger, more vigorous, more popular rival. And that's something we see endlessly played out in life, isn't it? We see it in the world of work. If you lose your job in your 40s and 50s, it can be very hard to find another because the world seems to prefer younger people. They're more malleable. They're not so crusty. Better for the image of the company. And suddenly we feel that we're past it. I remember the days of being a a young curate, the sort of new kid on the block. And I recall looking at people 30 or 20 years older than me and subconsciously thinking, well, I'm never going to be like that. Well, all too quickly we are. And there's a new generation. We're history, or so it can seem. And it can make someone feel quite bitter, as the king says, suddenly very isolated, past it, and over the hill. But of course, that's the way the world looks at it. That's life under the sun. And as so often, the writer is describing life without God and without the perspective of God. And so again through this passage are the little insights that temper his depression and his frustration. Things that enable this loneliness to be born. And here are the two. First of all, human friendship in verses 8 to 12. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling? Why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless and miserable business. Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Friendship is a, a quality that's all too often ignored today. And yet we all need friends. In fact, John Milton said that the first thing God pronounced not good was the loneliness of man. Up to that stage in the creation, everything was very good. But when God saw man on his own, he said, it is not good that he should be alone. And so he created marriage, man and woman, to provide friendship for one another. And it was for friendship, first and foremost it seems, that marriage was created. In fact, verse 12 is often regarded as being a picture of marriage, the cord of three strands not being quickly broken, the man, the woman, and God himself. And it's certainly true that any friendship and any marriage is stronger for having God as part of it. But it's not clear that that's what he's referring to. Maybe he's simply pointing out the fact that friendships don't have to be exclusive. 
sometimes a group of three friends can be stronger. That's why we often talk about, or people often talk about, prayer triplets, when three gather together to meet with one another, to share their needs, and to pray for one another. If it's just in, in twos, then one pe person may miss it, and the group falls apart. But somehow in three, it seems to work. Maybe there is a good biblical precedent for it. Maybe, therefore, there is a challenge, therefore, to think what we individually and collectively can do to be a friend to others and to experience that friendship for ourselves. Who can we befriend? Whom can, who can we give ourselves to and share with? It's often said the best way to make a friend is to be a friend. So there is human friendship. But of course you can't read these words with also, with also, without also being conscious of the friendship of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not explicit here because Solomon wouldn't have known that for himself. But surely as we read these words, as we read about friendship, we're reminded that the greatest friend that any of us can ever have is the Lord Jesus Christ. The one of whom Proverbs speaks of as there are friends who pretend to be friends, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He is the true answer to loneliness. He is the one above all we can trust. And he's the reason why none of us need ever say we're completely on our own. Yes, there is the loneliness of oppression. Yes, there is the loneliness of envy. Yes, there is a sort of isolation that we feel in all sorts of different situations. But in Christ, there is a true friend, the friend above all friends. And it's to his friendship that we must look.